Hey folks, Steve here with another video review for uh, a game that I've gotten to play a couple of times now, solo, um, and feel like I can give a good review on it, and that game is Reds, uh, the Russian Civil War by GNT Games, designed by Ted, Ted Reiser, I want to say it's Reiser, maybe it's Reiser, uh, a designer who's done a number of World War I games as well as World War II games, uh, and this is really one of the fewer... Uh, Russian Civil War games that are out there. Uh, it, it's not a topic that gets covered in war games very often, um, and so I was kind of excited, you know, when I got a hold of this, that I could get it to the table eventually. It took a few years, but now I have, and I can talk to it a little bit today. Um, another Russian Civil War game that I have that I'd like to take a look at at one time or another is uh, the strategy and tactics Russian Civil War game here, um, multiplayer game. Uh, a lot different, I think, than this game, but uh, at some point I'll give it give it a roll and hopefully we'll be able to do another review for that. Um, I'll also be getting the new second deluxe edition of Triumph of Chaos, which is another Russian Civil War game, um, sort of a card-driven game. should be getting that hopefully soon, and I can do some coverage of that as well. But for the game that we're talking about today, uh, I was playing with the uh, 2012 second printing, which is the latest printing of the game, um, and the rules as printed in the second edition are the latest rules with all the errata. So if you're looking at this game, um, just know that uh, if you're getting the second edition, there are no more errata or updates to the rules. Um, what you see here is what you're going to get, which is, you know, good. Um, no need to go hunting for anything else on the web. Now, uh, a couple of things just to keep in mind. This game is out of print. So as I do this review, um, it's for the benefit of folks who are maybe thinking about buying a second-hand copy. Um, if you're looking into that, uh, if this seems like a game that might be for you, uh, then certainly seek it out. And then otherwise, um, we're sort of at the mercy of GMT doing another printing. So, you know, keep your fingers crossed, I guess, if you'd like to see more Russian Civil War type content uh, in, in that space. Um, the way the game is structured as a two-player game, just to give some sort of high-level overview, is uh, one player is playing, obviously, the Reds, the, the Bolshevik forces of the Russian Civil War, uh, versus the Whites, which um, some folks might, uh, in talking about the Russian Civil War, kind of simplify it down to being monarchists. It's not necessarily totally true, but at least for this game's purposes, the Whites are basically the anti-Bolshevik uh, uh, forces on the map, and they'll be vying to uh, take control of Russia in the post-World War I um, time frame. So, uh, in terms of just general components, the game has a paper map, which I've put some uh, plex plexiglass over. Um, it's got a couple of uh, appropriately colored player aid charts, uh, a white one and a pink but red. Uh, player aid card with various bits of information on it. Uh, rule book is 24 pages. Not too bad. Good to go. You get a few dice, a red one and a white one, you know, cute, cutely enough. Um, and obviously uh, a, a bunch of counters. Um, the game uses a chip pull system uh, to determine uh, the action order. And uh, there's a couple of interesting mechanics in terms of how the turns play out, which I'll get more in depth uh, here in the next section of this video. Um, in terms of, I guess, just a, as another kind of high-level thing, um, the game is sort of a hex and counter uh, setup. So you have your, your, your counters representing different uh, armed forces, and movement is basically... Um, hex to hex, with things like the railroads being very important pieces of your strategic puzzle, um, as is appropriate for the time frame and the sort of history uh, of, of the war. Um, in terms of complexity, it is relatively light complexity. There are some rules, um, bits that can be easy to overlook and maybe get wrong as you play, uh, but overall isn't too bad. So. Uh, Let's take a closer look at the game, the game components, and the way the rules are set up, uh, and gameplay in general, and then we'll, at the end of the video, get to my overall thoughts and sort of review rating for the game.
Okay, so let's take a closer look at the game map and the game components here. Uh, as you can see, the map, which I've got most, uh, mostly in the camera view here, uh, stretches from uh, Poland and the Baltics in sort of the, the left, the west part of the map, and then stretches out into uh, the areas past the Urals a little bit, out through Central Asia, um, as well as the Caucasus region. You can sort of see down below uh, in the southern area. Uh, in terms of components, one thing I really like about this particular game, so I'll just call it out now, is that uh, the chit quality, you know, counter quality, uh, is actually very high, um, all things considered, even though, um, you know, this seems like a game that maybe would be, uh, they might use more medium quality components. It's actually quite good. You can see here on the camera that, that the counter thickness is actually quite thick using some of the brown sort of interior stock. Very thick counters, very sturdy counters, which I really liked um, when playing this. Um, let's take a look at, I guess the first thing as I try to explain the game mechanics here. I'm going to be struggling with my camera here, but if you look at the turn track there, there's a couple of things that is worth pointing out in terms of how the game uh, operate. So one, the numbered turns, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on, all the way out to 24, are what the game calls operational turns. And it's during operational turns that really the bulk of the game is going to take place. These are the turns where you're moving units, you're having battles, um, really where all the action is. But you can see, uh, while one's sort of covered by units that are going to be reinforcements, that there are boxes, and they are turns, sort of in the brown-orange color, uh, that are lettered A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. These are what the game calls strategic turns, and it's during uh, strategic turns that you would check for automatic victory conditions, uh, as well as things like allied withdrawal, which I'll talk about here shortly, um, and then you do reinforcements, so bringing in units that are there on the turn track to come into the game, as well as getting uh, very restricted amounts of replacements to bring eliminated units back onto the map. Um, you also see that there is a track for resources, and resources are basically used, one, as a, a track to determine when the allies will withdraw from the white cause, uh, and will also help the reds in terms of their replacements uh, during those strategic turns. You can kind of see uh, right there above the uh, the turn track, I have a big pile of units, and that's because in this game, on strategic turn B, a lot changes in the game, and, and what strategic turn B kind of signifies is the end of World War I with an Allied victory, um, which opens up parts of the map that start the game closed. And those parts uh, of the map are considered occupied by the Central Powers, because uh, if you know by history, the Central Powers basically had won in the Eastern Front, and the Eastern Theater, uh, and had begun sort of taking control of large parts of Eastern Europe. So there is a line, and I'm going to try to get that on camera here, if I can get zoomed in correctly. I'm sure this camera work is going to give somebody a headache. If you can see, there is uh, here this sort of barbed wire line. That is the occupation line. So at the very beginning of the game, no forces can be west uh, of that occupation line, and that whole area of the map is basically cut off, um, and it runs sort of over and around Rostov. Uh, once you get to that strategic turn B, then those areas open up and they become a big part of the strategic decision making uh, in terms of what uh, you're going to do there as well as Poland's uh, role in the game, which I'll talk to here again in a little bit. So just to do some level setting on what you're seeing here. Um, now the, the general setup uh, of all of this is that at the beginning of the game, the Reds have the benefits of interior lines centered around Moscow. Uh, all of their rail lines ultimately meet here in Moscow and uh, provide really their primary path of supply and um, leveraging to move around the map. 
the whites at the very beginning of the game really have two areas of strength. They have the Siberians, which are sort of in the north up here, and then the AFSR, Armed Forces of uh, Southern Russia, which are down here and relatively limited in number, but a po pretty potent force, all things considered. Now, the way the game is structured is, again, reliant on a chip pool system, and that chip pool actually differs for each faction. Now, the way it, it really works is that for the white player, they have activation chits that essentially equate to groups of units or factions within the white overall faction. So, for instance, here are some activation chits for uh, Siberian forces in green and the AFSR in sort of this bluish color, bluish green color. These are the chits, and if they were to be drawn from a cup, uh, they would activate for movement and combat all the units of that particular faction. So if we drew the AFSR chit, we'd get to move the units down here. If we drew the Siberian chit, it would instead be the units up here. Now for the reds, that theirs works a little bit differently. You can sort of see on the map uh, these sort of red outlines. So there's one that kind of runs up through here uh, and along through here. Those red boundaries, red dotted line boundaries, basically are representing regions. And the way the reds do their chit pull is that they will pull a chit for a particular region. So here is an example uh, of southwest and south. So if we pulled the uh, south chit, we would get to activate all of the units, uh, all the red units for activity in the southern front, which would be basically down here. For the most part, it does mean that there are southern chits that are going to equate to uh, white chits. So clearly a southern chit drawn is going to be conducting combat with a uh, AFSR unit, very likely. Uh, while those drawn for the east front, which is pretty broad and covers basically this area, is likely going to be fighting Siberian units. And as you can imagine, because of chit pull, the order that those chits are pulled uh, will have sort of a determining factor on who's going to get to areas first, and the attacking and all that good stuff. So I think the, the, the other way to kind of get through how to explain the way the game works is to kind of go through the sequence of play, which you could look at in the PDF of the rules available on GMT's website. Um, so the first thing you would do in an operational turn is determine initiative. It's basically a straight-up die roll. Highest uh, will have the initiative. And then what happens is that the players will roll dice to determine their random event for the turn. So the player who doesn't have initiative would go first and they're going to roll two dice, and they're going to consult their player aid chart, which is going to basically inform them what their random event will be. Now, these random events are positive for the person rolling them, uh, but it uses a 2d6 uh, die roll, which means that the result that's in, say, like the 6, 7, 8 um, result on the chart are going to be more likely to occur than, say, the 2 result or the 12 result just based on a bell curve distribution of a 2 die 6 die roll. And typically, what some of those results are going to be will either be uh, the allowance of adding another special unit to the map. So there's a couple of examples of that, which I will show here on camera. So we have uh, things like a armored train unit, perhaps an aircraft, or even a river flotilla. And what these units basically do is allow you to have additional force in battle calculations, which we'll talk about here shortly, um, adding manpower and uh, attack bonuses basically for, for the combat die roll. They are good to have, though uh, that luck of getting what you want, um, sometimes you're, you're left hanging and not getting the events that you, that you want. There's a lot of luck, I think, in some ways involved in this game because of that, which isn't necessarily a good thing, though it does lend itself to replayability. Once the events are uh, carried out, 
You then have what is referred to as the Machno Allegiance phase. Now, this is only something that takes place once uh, the occupation areas have opened up after turn B. And basically what that means is that the Machno Partisan Unit will either be functionally red or functionally white for the turn. There are special partisan units here that I'm probably not going to be able to get focused on in the camera right, but um, they are going to be occupying certain areas of the map around here. There's a special color notation for the map. And the units are either going to be white or red, depending on who's the closest unit. So basically, if the closest unit uh, to the partisan is a white unit, it will turn red. Uh, if the closest unit is red, it will turn white. This is sort of the game's way of portraying a faction in the Russian Civil War that really wasn't red or white. It was sort of its own, um, I don't know, anarchist, sometimes called black forces in, in the context of the Russian Civil War. And uh, because the game is really set up to be one faction versus the other faction, or one color versus the other color, uh, this is the game's way of sort of portraying that. This partisan unit isn't a huge deal in the game, but it can be an annoyance, um, and this is the way the game's dealing with that. I appreciate the effort to include that historical detail in the game for sure. Um, I do like that. Once that's complete, then uh, the players are going to look at strategic movement, and basically, to, to do a short description of it, it's going to mean moving units up to a certain capacity based on the faction along rail and river locations that you can control uh, from city to city. So uh, there are some restrictions on that, and it's based around manpower. So, for instance, the Reds can move, I, th I think it's like nine manpower... Uh, worth of units to areas they control, while the white player can do a very limited number of manpower based on faction, meaning Siberian versus AFSR, and, and some units simply aren't going to be able to be strategically moved, which, which is kind of a challenge. Um, to kind of show what I'm talking about in terms of what manpower is, here's a, just a standard red, red unit there is the little number here on the left beside the NATO symbol, this one being a 4. That is the manpower rating of a unit. Then you have an attack rating modifier, plus 3, the defense, plus 2, and then movement, which is 3 for this unit. On the flip side, when a unit is disordered, sometimes those values will change. The manpower value typically will not change. We'll put that back for now. So, uh, again, strategic movement, you're then moving units around. The reds have a special marker, which is the red train. Uh, during strategic movement, as sort of the last step, the red player will get to, to move the red train unit, and basically the benefits of the red trade unit, red train unit, is, you know, this is sort of representing Trotsky's red train, and he's moving around, providing moral support to the, the red forces. Um, when there is a logistics phase, which I'll talk to in a minute, Basically, any units in or adjacent to the red train hex will automatically rally and become fully ordered rather than uh, disordered. So, again, you know, just to show the flip side is disordered. During a rally, they would become flipped to full strength, so it's easier with the red train in the area that it's located for these units to become full strength again. Once the, uh, the strategic movement step is done, then we get into the action phase, which really involves those chit pulls. The benefit of being the initiative player is that you'll get to be, you know, it means you're, one, you're going first, and you're going to get to pick one of your available chits to just simply be played and start off the turn. And that can be pretty valuable because you like to get the jump on things. Um, otherwise, you're then making sure that you have all of the chit pulls that you're going to, or all the chits, all the activation chits that you're going to get for the turn. Obviously, um, this is what the, the backside of these look like. Siberian act, the act markers. Um, so for the most part, the white player is always going to get the ones that he gets to have based on what forces are in play. So once we get to strategic turn B and say Poland becomes uh, an activation, you know, capable faction, you'll add the Poland activation marker to 
uh, the pile that the white player will get to put into the cup to be drawn. For the red player, it's a little more complicated. So one, the, uh, the red player is always going to get to put in this field staff chit. When the field staff chit is drawn, they can basically activate one front on the map that hasn't already been activated for the turn. It can even be uh, for a front that chit hasn't been drawn yet so that they can maybe get what, get done what they want to get done there rather than waiting for the actual chit to be drawn. So we could do uh, field staff and activate the southern front, but when the south front chit is actually pulled, it'll then simply be discarded because only one front can actually be activated per turn. Otherwise, uh, in addition to the field staff chit, the red player can also put in two chits that he doesn't have leaders for. So at the bare minimum, uh, the red player is going to be activating two to three fronts as just a baseline. Um, when it comes to leaders, this is a result that can come up on the random event uh, die table. And this is one of the tough areas because I think for a red player when playing this game, if you're unlucky and you don't get leaders, the game might be a lot harder for you than another time that you play the game and you get really lucky uh, on the die roll charts and you get plenty of leaders. Just to kind of show a little bit here, you know, this is the random uh, events table. You can get a red leader on results of 10, 11, or 12, which, you know, again, just based on luck, you might get really lucky and get plenty of leaders, in other cases you won't. If you were to get that result, you would roll a die to randomly determine what front gets a leader, and then randomly draw a leader chit to determine who the leader is. Now, that sounds kind of complicated. It's really not too bad. Basically what it means is once you have a leader in a particular front, that chit for that front will always go into the randomizer cup to be drawn, so you have a guaranteed ability to take action there. The leaders are these particular chits here. So just as an example, and I'm not sure it's going to show up on the camera real well, uh, I'll be fighting with the focus, is uh, Egorov and uh, Tukachevsky. So when these leaders are in play, and I'm going to shift the view, down here there is the Red Army High Command uh, box. So each front has a box here, so when that uh, leader result is on the random die uh, event, random event chart. You'd roll the die, determine what uh, front, randomly draw from the available leaders. And let's say I drew Tukachevsky, then he might go and say the south front, and we'd put his marker there. And so it would mean we'd, we'd likely get to be activating the south front every turn. And in addition to that, the number on the leader chit is going to determine how many hexes in that front have an increased stacking limit, which is very important for the reds. We'll get into that here. Uh, I guess I guess there's no better time than now. So let's talk about what happens when you actually activate units. So when you draw the chit, you'll activate all those units, and they can all be moved, and they can all be used to attack. There is first the movement step, so you do have to conduct all movement before you do any combat. Uh, but then you can initiate combats, you can complete a combat uh, before moving on to the next one, um, or even choosing if you're going to attack after a, another attack, so to speak. So there are some options there. And just to kind of, I guess, show what I mean in terms of these stacking points. So... Let me get, uh, sorry, someone's going to get motion sick. Here we go. So if we look here, the base stacking in the game is six manpower points per hex. As you can see, as an example, all these big red units, almost every single one except for one or two special units, tend to be four manpower points. So if the limit is six, two of them together, say this unit and this unit, could not stack together because together that's eight stacking points, which means they can 
you know, they, they can't be stacked with one another. Whoops. But if you had, say, a leader in the area, then what that would mean is that a single hex, or in the case of Tukhachevsky, two hexes in that front would have an increased stacking value of nine for the reds. So if we had the leader, Tukhachevsky, in the south front, these units could stack together. Now, you might question, why does that even matter? Well, it comes into the really weird way combat is calculated in this game. It's really one of the more unique combat systems I've seen in a game like this. So, just by a point of comparison, to show you what I mean, the whites tend to have lower manpower per unit. So if I look here at the Don Cossacks, there's two of them here. Two units, each of two manpower, means there's four. We could actually fit another uh, two manpower uh, unit in there, or maybe two one manpower units like these two here. So these could, in theory, all be in a hex together. And I'll just go ahead and put them over here as if we were to attack that city. So the way combat works is, uh, you know, the rule book has a way that they lay it out, and I'm going to explain it in the order that I actually do it. It's a mathematical equation, and it doesn't necessarily matter what order you do the calculation in, just that you do it correctly. So, the basic rule of thumb here is more manpower than your opponent is good. But also, more units, even if they're weak units, the, the larger number of units involved is even better. So, in this example here, we have, uh, and let's just say for the sake of argument, that this unit is full strength and we'll ignore this Red Verdun unit. Basically, this is a special marker. Uh, basically, just means you ignore retreats here uh, in Zaritsyn while that marker is present. Those two units versus these four units. Get that centered a little bit. So, how we do the number calculation is, first thing we will we'll want to do is compare the manpower values. So, 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 manpower for the reds. For the whites, it is 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 is 6. 6 to 8 is a... We'll, we'll, we would maybe say it's a 1 to 1 ratio, almost, but not quite. And then in those cases, you round to the next possible value on the combat odds chart. So, uh, that's over here in the lower right of the map. I'll try to get it on camera here. Combat odds. So it's going to range from 1 to 3, 1 to 2, 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1. You're basically going to find the odds. And in this combat, it's 6 to 8, which you round down, you basically round in favor of the defender, which would be 1 to 2. So we're going to be looking at the 1 to 2 column. And for now, we ignore uh, the rest of that chart while I explain the rest of the, uh, the combat system. So, first you calculate the combat odds, which tells you what column you're on. Then, what you'll do is you will roll a die. For each side, one die. Okay, so we got two and two. What you do is you multiply the die roll by the number of units present. So, for the reds, two times two is four. For the whites, 2 times 4 is 8. Then you add all the modifiers for the units, depending on what's happening here. So for the reds, they're defending. So you're going to add the defensive modifier bonus for each of the units here. So 2 times 2 is 4, plus the 4 for the bonuses from the units themselves is 8. So the overall value for the reds is 8. For the whites, Again, we multiply, so 2 times 4 is 8, plus all the attacking bonuses. And there's 8 attacking bonuses here, 2 basically for each unit present. Uh, so the value is 16. So overall, white value is 16, the red value is uh, 8. So 16 to 8, 
Then you determine the differential. <laughs> um, so 16 minus 8 is 8. So after all of that, we've determined it is plus 8 in the white's favor, which we then would look at on the combat odds uh, for what row that we're on. So plus 8 on the 1 to 2 chart gives us, uh, you can kind of see plus 7 through 9, so we're on that row, gives a lowercase a, lowercase d, and an r result. So what does that mean? Well, basically, uh, if it's a lowercase, that means the unit with the highest manpower value will take a hit. Um, player's choice, uh, you know, receiving player's choice, depending on uh, if you have multiple options because they're all the same manpower value. And then a retreat, the, the big R means all the units will retreat uh, depending on whose uh, value is next to the R. So you could have a case where the attacker retreats because it's an AR. If it's a DR or an ADR, it means the defender retreats. So uh, if our result was an ADR, first the attacker is going to take a hit. Uh, we need to do it on one of the two uh, two manpower units. So we'll, we'll simply flip this unit like so. And then for the reds, uh, they have to take one. And if these units were not in red Verdun, uh, they'd have to retreat, and we would retreat them, uh, I believe it's two hexes uh, away from the combat. So we would maybe retreat them uh, back this way or over here. Um, and then that would be the end of that combat. So the, the basic lesson of this is that you want to have as many number of units as possible, but where you don't have the number of units, if you have a manpower advantage, that can be very helpful as well. And typically, uh, the reds are going to have a good advantage in manpower most of the time, while the whites will have the numerical advantage. It will matter in cases where, you know, if the defender has fewer units but rolls pretty well, they could end up with a much better value than if you did, say, a roll of a 1. 1 times 4 is only 4, but, uh, you know, 2 times 6 is a 12. Obviously, that's a pretty big difference, and the whites are going to have a lot harder of a time if the die roll goes uh, that way. Now, uh, besides all of that, there is a special activation shit that will come into play, and that is the, oh gosh, I'm not going to be able to get this on the camera, the logistics chit. So the logistics chit is basically thrown in there with the rest of the markers, and if you pull it, it will cause a logistics phase to be done. And what is done in a logistics phase is that uh, you are basically looking to check supply for the whites and then uh, they're going to do a rally step and then the reds are going to check for supply and then do a rally step. Now checking for supply is relatively simple. You're going to be looking at different supply centers where the source of supply is for different units. So for the Siberians, um, Omsk, way out, uh, out here is the supply center for the Siberians. Um, for the AFSR, they are typically going to be pulling supply from this city here, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. Basically, you can get supply if you are on a rail line that can go unimpeded back to one of these places, or you're off by one hex, so you're adjacent to a rail line that can trace all the way back. Enemy units will interrupt that supply line, as will their zones of control. So most units in this game do have a zone of control in the immediate hexes around them, and that can be good ways to cut supply by moving units around the rail lines, thus depriving uh, units of supply. If a unit is out of supply during a supply check with a logistics jet, uh, they will take a hit, meaning they'll flip to their disordered side. If a unit that's already disordered is out of supply here, uh, they'll be removed and uh, suffer an elimination. So cutting off supply lines of the enemy can actually be a really great way to soften them up to be defeated. Something that's important to note in terms of the rules 
uh, in the combat results is that you typically are not going to, well, I'll put it this way, you cannot eliminate a fully ordered unit in combat. The worst result that you can get by default is a disorder, which all it's going to do to a full strength unit is flip it. There is no eliminate result on the combat results chart. Now, uh, that does mean if you disorder an already disordered unit, you can get rid of them, but it's so long as your opponent has fully rallied or fully ordered units, uh, they're going to be around for a while. So kind of what you'll want to do in, strat in terms of strategy is hope to surround the enemy or cut their supply lines before the logistics chit is drawn, and then once that logistics chit is drawn and they become disordered, uh, on your next opportunity to attack them, uh, you can seek to eliminate them. Once you're, you are done checking supply and disordering units that would need to be disordered, in supply units have an opportunity to be rallied. So you would go one by one to each unit that is disordered and you'll roll a die. And typically, uh, though there are chances for modifiers and different influences based on random events and different things like that, uh, typically you need to roll a one or a two on a, for a particular unit to rally it. And if it successfully rolls that one or a two, you can flip it to its fully ordered side. Now, this is another area of the game where luck can be I think a real game changer, which is unfortunate. So I've had times when I've played this where the Whites uh, basically didn't get a single success across any of their units on the board, while the Reds got pretty consistent rallies in really important areas. And that can be incredibly frustrating. If you're fighting in a particular area, and it's a very important area, you could just have the worst luck, and, and even if you get rallies, it's units elsewhere on the board that get rallied, and the ones in the most important areas don't get rallied, and it can be, again, very frustrating. In terms of some strategy considerations because of the way all of this works, there are going to be things um, that you would be seeking to do, uh, like I said, to uh, cut those supply lines. So in an example here, you would maybe be wanting to do something like this where the Zocs from the various units are creating a sort of an isolated effect. So Zocs here are blocking supply along this river. The Zoc here is uh, disrupting the supply line on this rail. And now this unit is out of supply. Then on the uh, that supply check, this unit becomes flipped. And at some later juncture, assuming the... Uh, the player on another turn hasn't been able to re-establish supply lines or have gotten other units in here, you would then attack and have pretty great odds to, uh, to eliminate it. One of the tough things in terms of that strategy is going to be if you fail to attack them before they get to go, this unit could potentially pick off individual units now that they've spread out like this. So it's sort of, at least for the white player, a tough st strategic decision to make um, is do you spread out your units to envelop the enemy to cut off their supply lines and defeat them that way while running the risk of exposing those particular units to being crushed themselves. Another thing that can be a way to eliminate units, if I just get rid of this red, uh, red Verdun marker here, and, and this unit will have to retreat if it gets a retreat as a result, is if you make this attack like this, and it gets a retreat, so a disordered, say, a DR result, the D will disorder the unit, and now it must retreat. But, as part of that retreat, it's going to be forced to retreat through enemy zones of control. If that is the case, for each zone of control that you retreat through, you take another hit. So in this case, this is the one instance or one sort of event that would cause a fully ordered unit to become disordered and then removed is if they are forced to retreat, you know, they take a hit and then are forced to retreat through enemy ox. That's how you would also eliminate them. And there is advance after combat, so you'd probably do something like this, where all the units advance. And so they're once again fully stacked with one another. 
and best position to defend against the enemy. Um, so, you know, again, in getting back to that strategy, there are going to be points where rolling the, the well, not rolling the dice, but <laughs> taking the chances of drawing the chits in the right order is really going to be important. You're going to look at each front and be considering what are the risks if I move before the logistics chit comes up, what do I do if the logistics chip has already come up and I get to go before or after my opponent? All those different sort of uh, considerations are going to be important. I, I almost want to make a little uh, <laughs> a little chart to, to show the decision making on you know how do you assess the risk if, for instance, you have to move before your opponent and the logistics chip might come up after that. Right? There's sort of there are pros and cons to all of that. Um, but once all the chits have actually been pulled and all the units and all the, the uh, fronts have been activated, then that's going to signal the end of the turn and you move on to the next. And again, if the next turn ends up being a strategic turn, that's where you're going to check for victory. Um, you're going to do allied withdrawal and you're going to do the reinforcements. What allied withdrawal means is uh, at certain junctures on these strategic turns, there is a threshold or a benchmark that the whites need to have for control of resources. Resources come in really two flavors, and there's only only one of one of them, and the rest are the the other. Uh, there are cities on the the map um, that are their hexes are outlined in white. There's various across the map. These are resource cities, so they are important and worth grabbing. Uh, the other kind is the gold treasury. So it starts as the people's gold. If the whites gain it, it becomes the uh, the imperial gold. This is worth a resource uh, in the game. Basically, if the whites do not have the required number of resources on the, on the turn track, um, they will suffer first minor allied withdrawal, which forces some pe minor penalties on them, and then on the second time they are not meeting that threshold major allied withdrawal happens and it's really kind of a killer point in the game because it means that uh, the main white factions no longer get replacements uh, all the allied uh, intervention force units that are on the map uh, are removed and, and basically it's just a really bad time for the white players so the, really the white player is going to be looking to avoid having that happen um, though it may mean that Poland gets entangled in the war uh, easier because of allied uh, withdrawal. So there's sort of a balance that gets activated as a part of that. Uh, the victory check is ultimately um, really only going to be relevant, I guess, for the white player most of the time. Uh, basically, the white player wins uh, if they are able to uh, take away enough resource cities from the reds or take Moscow from them uh, and then reach this victory check on a strategic turn. They can't just win by taking Moscow and then that's it. They actually have to uh, play all the way through to a strategic turn where victory is checked. If they're able to do that, they can win that way. Otherwise, the Reds are going to be seeking to win um, their automatic, automatic victory conditions before the final turn is played out. And they have kind of a two different options. One is to take every resource hex on the map and also conquer, I believe it's Poland, and then the other is to sort of ignore Poland and the Baltics and take every single city in Russia. So um, sort of, you know, I guess the red player can decide which one they want to venture on and focus their efforts in that way. Um, I think that's a pretty good overview of the game mechanics. Obviously there's a lot of this, this sort of strategy tips and things to consider when looking at the game, um, but would take much, much uh, too much time for this video. Um, there's plenty of fun to be had here, a lot of interesting mechanics, but I think the frustrating bits come in with how the die rolls and the luck impact not what you're doing, but what you're able to do. And if you have bad luck, that really just shuts down uh, your ability to uh, do what you want to do, which can sometimes not exactly be fun. So let's uh, go ahead and start taking a look at final thoughts. Okay, so what did I think of the game? Uh, well, I certainly had fun with it, um, which is, you know, when it comes to a game, if you're having fun with it, that's usually a good sign. Uh, my first playthrough, uh, which I did do a session report on, a, a fairly detailed session report, um, which 
I will put the uh, link to that on Board Game Geek down in the description. Um, it includes some screenshots and a turn-by-turn -turn, uh, in-depth look at what I did during the turn and the different actions taken. Um, in that game, the Whites uh, actually won an automatic victory by taking uh, Moscow. They had really pushed with the southern Russian forces up and, and took that. Um, and it was probably midway through the game that I was able to achieve that white victory. My second game, uh, I was the Reds, and also won fairly early in the game um, by taking uh, all of the resource hexes and invading, uh, I believe it was Poland, and we did it that way, if I recall. And here, here's the thing. So I think this game is good. It's certainly fun. And some of the things that I appreciated were uh, the, the, the named units and sort of, you know, that got me looking into the history of those units and, and why things are portrayed the way they are, which is pretty cool. Um, it's, again, not very complex, and so, you know, it's relatively easy to get to the table, and it plays pretty quick. Once you've got the rules down, you can play solitaire with a friend who knows the rules reasonably, reasonably well, and you can get through the game in a pretty fast clip. You can get moving. Um, it doesn't take too long to play. Uh, and there are some good uh, risk assessment analysis decisions to make in terms of spreading out your units or bringing them together and defending your supply lines. So the hex and counter operational feel uh, is pretty cool and pretty fun. Finding those positions of where you can cut supply or leveraging the rivers and the railroads, that's all kind of cool and um, fun to play. I think the thing that holds this game back is that luck factor that I've mentioned a little bit. Um, if you have a front that you're uh, sort of having trouble with, and you have units that are disordered, uh, and you get the rallies, and you don't get any rallies on those units because it's a it's a you know 33% chance, but that's enough that you could roll for every unit and say uh, the Eastern Front or the Siberians, and you know get no units that have become rallied. <sighs> that can be very frustrating, and it's nothing you know it, it's so it's not so much even. Um, like it's you can't do anything about that, and I think that's what's a bummer. So, obviously, a lot of war games, you know, part of the fun or part of the challenge is reacting to things that you can't control. So, when you have a die roll and a combat go badly, you have to sort of deal with the repercussions of that. But here, you know, units are going to become disordered, right? That's just going to happen as part of combats and different th types of things. But when you can't get good rallies, you could see an entire front collapse because those disordered units are only going to take one more hit before they're eliminated. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just that die roll, and if you get really bad rolls, you're, you're just screwed. Um, same thing with the random events. You know, there is a random event for Allied Intervention Force offensives. So historically, yeah, the Allies, uh, the intervention forces they sent to Russia really didn't do any major offensives. But it is possible, otherwise these TAN units here for the Allied forces uh, are, are merely going to move around the map, they can't attack anything. Um, it would make a big difference if they could a lot more often, but you're typically not going to roll that, uh, that result on the random event table. At least I did it very, very uh, rarely. And so all of that kind of just plays into it where I feel like the random events are okay, uh, but the ones that are actually useful, yeah, they won't come up very often. Maybe that is good by design, but some of these die rolls are just frustrating. Um, so I would think, you know, if we're fortunate enough to get a third edition or another printing via P500 or, or whatever from, from GMT, I would hope that in that new edition they try to do something about those die rolls a little bit. Um, I do think this game deserves to get a reprint. I think it is a good game. Um, it's a fun game. Being relatively low complexity, you can you can get it to the table, you can play it through. It has enough uh, of the design dedication that Ted tends to put into his games that it, it makes for a good version of the Russian Civil War, though I'll need to compare it with some of these other games. Um, 
but if that luck factor were was, I don't know, changed a little bit so that the player has a little more agency, I think it would be a better game for it. So, you know, again, hey, third printing, third edition, it would be nice to see a little bit of that, a little bit of fixing there. Um, you know, if you're the red player and you never get a leader, that's a way different situation in a game than where you get a lot of leaders. And, again, you're just at the, the mercy of those die rolls. Um, and it's not like you can do a whole lot about it either way, which is a bummer. You know, again, you would compare that to a situation where a die roll gives you a bad situation, but you can have decisions or ways to deal with that. Here, so much of the time, if you get a bad die roll, you really can't mitigate it with anything, and that's just kind of a bummer. Um, there's a point where <clears throat> you, you're, as the, <coughs> excuse me, as the white player, you're trying to make that drive to get an automatic victory if you can. It's certainly something you want to be trying to do, and it's fun to try to look for those opportunities and to be making progress, but inevitably, you will reach a point where the whites fail, uh, and when they begin to crack, they really collapse. So allied withdrawal will happen, and then their units aren't going to be coming back, and from there on out, you know, you're really trying to keep the Reds from getting a victory. So if the Reds don't meet one of their victory conditions by the end of the 24th turn, then the Whites will win. And that's because the designer has this view that the Whites couldn't realistically have won the conflict. The only way that you would do that in this game is if you won an automatic victory by taking Moscow or, or all the resource cities, where, you know, if you just survive until the 24th turn, that's doing better than history, but as the white player, that's just not fun. Um, I mean, you know, there are other games that do that where you're sort of holding on as best you can, and there can be fun in that. But in this game, you know, once you reach that collapse, that, that point where you begin to collapse, and it's all downhill from there, the game isn't quite as fun. For the Reds, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, the game's called Reds. They're meant to always have fun, I guess. I don't know. Uh, you know, there's a point where they're struggling to survive at the beginning and, and get their forces firmed up, but then once they do that and they get pretty strong, then you sort of have the fun of, you know, trying to fight and conquer territory and you're on the clock. And that can still be fun. So you, as the Reds, you're, you're kind of, you've got a lot going on, but you, you've got ways to turn the game around and then you're going to have fun through the end. Where the Whites are, are involved, they're going to reach a point where the game just starts to become less fun because of that. And I'm not sure there's anything that could be done in a new edition of the game to change that, um, simply because of the way it's designed and the fact that uh, the whites will eventually just start to fall apart unless they're doing very, very well, like I did in my first playthrough in that session report you can read. So, um, you know, really overall, I, I think I would give this game, in terms of like a rating number, um, 7 out of 10. I think it's a pretty good game. That's like a B minus or something, or maybe a, a C. Uh, or something in, in, in terms of uh, a grade. Um, it's a good game. It's a fun game. There are things that, like that, like I said, the luck can be a downer. It's the whites. You might not always have the best fun at certain points in the game. Um, but if you're looking for a game to scratch the Russian Civil War itch because it's a topic that you're interested in, this is a great place to start. If you're not interested in the Russian Civil War, um, this might not be a great title just to randomly pick up, but, uh, again, still, it's a pretty good low-complexity hex encounter game, or, you know, medium-complexity, light-complexity, uh, that can get, you know, a pretty quick playthrough, so there's some value in that. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you manage to find a second-hand copy, or one that's in its shrink at a, a, a game store like Noble Knight that has stock of, of older games unopened or whatever, um, I'd say maybe give it a give it a roll and, and see how you like it. Um, you know, uh, future will tell, I guess, if, if GMT is going to show interest in this product again. Uh, again, I, I do hope that they do that and that we get another opportunity for a new version of this game with some updates. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, we'll make do with what we got. So. That was Reds, the Russian Civil War, 1918 to 1921. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did like this video, hit the uh, like button down below. If you'd like to see more content like this, hit subscribe. 
Uh, this channel does game reviews like the one uh, you're watching here. Uh, it also does instructional videos for different games that I find to be a little more complex, but I really enjoy. And I like to do some instructional videos to make it a little bit easier for new players to, uh, to, to learn the game and get involved with it. So check those videos out. Uh, otherwise, uh, hope you have a good day. Take care, and uh, we'll see you later.